This is a wonderful night. Again, I, there's no other place I'd rather be than in God's house with God's people, celebrating our Savior. And I, if you have a Bible, I know it's probably dark out there, so just listen to me. If you, you know, if it's if you have a, if you use a phone or an iPad, I guess you can follow along. But I'm in Isaiah chapter seven tonight, and I want to talk to you about an Old Testament prophecy. It's just a few minutes. I want to point something out from the Scripture as we worship our Savior. I want to just point to the Word of God, which tells us all we know about Jesus. What do we know about Jesus outside the Scripture? Well, not much. Very, very, very little. What we know about our Savior Jesus is given to us in the inspired Word of God. And I want to point to a prophecy in the Old Testament that's a very well-known prophecy, especially this time of year. We hear these words, but I want us to look at it again and give you a little bit of depth of this prophecy. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 And this is the prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a beautiful prophecy in the Old Testament. Did you know one of the greatest ways to prove that the Bible is the word of God is by pointing to Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled? It was Justin Martyr that said to declare a thing which shall come to pass long before it comes to pass and then bring it to pass. He said, this or nothing is the work of God. And that's so very true. And did you know that there are over 400 prophecies in the Old Testament that speak about the Lord Jesus Christ? And Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies. Think about that. Every one of them. That's why I know two things for sure. I know a little bit more, but these two things especially I know for sure. Number one, I know the Bible is the word of God. And number two, I know that Jesus is the son of God. How else can you explain these prophecies and the fact that Jesus fulfilled every one of these to the very letter? Uh, Mathematicians using the principle of probability have concluded that the chances of these prophecies being fulfilled by chance or coincidence is pretty much impossible. It has to be the work of God. And here's one prophecy that I want to bring to your attention. I call this a, 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 a Christmas prophecy. And what I want you to see tonight are just three amazing things about this prophecy and three characteristics we could say. Here's the first one. Number one, a sign given. Again, he says in verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, let me talk to you about the context of this. I want you in your mind, if you will, just for a few minutes, go back with me all the way into the Old Testament. Isaiah is the prophet that we're looking at here. Isaiah lived and wrote this prophecy 750 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So go all the way back in the Old Testament and look at the context with me of this prophecy. Why did God give this prophecy uh, to Isaiah to give to the king of Judah at that time, who was a man by the name of King Ahaz. Let me tell you the background of what was going on. King Ahaz, the king of Judah, was afraid at this time when this prophecy was given to him. You know why? Because two kings had confederated together to say, we are going to destroy Judah. Uh, These two kings, the Bible says that they were the king of Syria and the king of um, also of of, uh, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, it says, son of Uzziah. Uh, Raisin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the, the son of Ramallah, and the king of Israel went up to, towards Jerusalem. So here are these two kings that have confederated together, the Bible says, and they basically threatened Ahaz and said, we're going to destroy you. We're going to destroy the whole house of David. Think about that threat. What if they were able to do that? What if they were able to completely wipe out Judah, wipe out the house of David? You know what that means? That means no Messiah, no Christ. Because the Bible says earlier in the, in the Old Testament that the Messiah was to come through the house of David. He was to be called a son of David. And if these two evil kings were able to do what they wanted and wipe out the house of David, there would be no Christ. There would be no Messiah. So God sends his prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz. King Ahaz is checking out the water supply The Bible says he's out there by the pools of water just outside of Jerusalem looking at the water supply because he's thinking an enemy army is going to attack and he wants to be ready. And the Bible says that Isaiah meets him there. Now, when God came to Isaiah and said, Isaiah, I want you to go and meet King Ahaz by the pools. And by the way, don't go by yourself. Take your son, Sheer Jasub, with you. 
Now, just know this, that Isaiah's wife just had a baby just a few months prior to that. So Isaiah is carrying in his arms an infant son. And I think this is an object lesson that God is giving uh, through the, his prophet Isaiah. So here's Isaiah. He comes with his little infant son in his arms. He comes to King Ahaz, and basically he says, King, I want to give you a promise. This is a promise from God, and I want you to listen. And basically, let me read to you what he says here in this promise. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Raisin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken. It shall not be a people. You say, what did he say there? Well, basically it was simply this. You have nothing to worry about, Ahaz, because these two kings are going to come to nothing. And their threats against you are going to come to nothing. Now, if you were King Ahaz at that moment, wouldn't you be happy? Unless you did not believe the prophet or you did not believe the word of God. And this was the problem with this King Ahaz. He had a hardened heart. So he didn't believe this prophet. He didn't believe the word of God. If he did, he would at that moment would have said, praise the Lord. Let's have a, let's have a celebration. Uh, he didn't do any of that. He continued with his preparations. Because he still didn't believe. And so therefore, Isaiah says, well, how about a sign? Would you like a sign from God to let you know that nothing is going to happen to the house of David? And listen to what King Ahaz says. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Ahaz, saying, ask thee of a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And so here's Isaiah, and he's saying, look, ask God for a sign. And Ahaz kind of, he puts on being spiritual. You ever, you ever see people that do that? Oh, I will not tempt the Lord by asking him a sign, you know, as if he's some spiritually pious person. Now, you know what? God knows who you are <laughs> in their very depths. And uh, by the way, if God asks you to ask for a sign, it's okay to ask for a sign. And then this is what the Lord said. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David. So Isaiah then turns from speaking to just King Ahaz because he's got this spiritual pious thing going on here. So God now turns to the whole house of David. And really, he turns to everyone, we could say. We could say he's even talking to us today. This prophecy that Isaiah gave was not just for King Ahaz. It was not just for the house of David back then. It was for everyone. And it's for you as well and me tonight. This sign. What will be the sign that God's going to give that he will protect the house of David, that he will protect his promise of a Messiah? Listen to verse 14. Here it is. Therefore... The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, here's the sign. A virgin is going to give birth to a little boy, a child, a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. Now, here's where the debate is. There's, did you know that there's a lot of people, scholars in the Old Testament area of study, who basically say, well, this, this is really not a virgin here. I mean, the, 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 the Hebrew word they say is Alma, and Alma is a word that can mean just a young woman. And that's really what it's talking about. A young woman's going to have a child. It's not really talking about a virgin. And, uh, and so there's a big debate among Old Testament scholars as to whether this word Alma should be translated young woman or should it be translated virgin. Of course, those who don't want to believe that Jesus is the Son of God have a tendency to downplay this prophecy and say, well, the word just simply means young woman. Now, let me just answer that by saying sometimes the word Alma, the Hebrew word, indeed is translated as young woman in the, in the Old Testament. But there are also times when this word is also translated to mean virgin. There is another Hebrew word, Bethulah, which can mean only virgin. Isaiah didn't use that word. Old Testament scholars say, well, if he meant virgin, surely he would have used that word. But a lot of times the context of a story will determine the meaning of the word. That's just true in English today. The context determines really what the word means. And what is the context? God had just said, I'm going to give you a sign. 
A great sign. The Hebrew word for sign is oath. A miraculous sign. We talk about a sign. We're talking about something that doesn't happen every day. Something that is incredible. Something that gets people's attention. Now, so think about it. That's the context. So if the sign was King Ahaz, house of David, all the world, I'm going to give you a sign. And here's the sign. A young woman's going to have a child. I said, wait a minute. That's not a sign. That happens all the time. Women are having babies all the time. That's not a sign. That's not miraculous. However, if a virgin will bring forth a son, now that's a sign. Now that's miraculous. And this is exactly what's going on here. A sign is given here in this passage. It can mean nothing else. And by the way, Matthew will affirm that because in Matthew chapter 1, many hundreds of years later, 750 years later, uh, we see, and by the way, this is the second part of this prophecy, a sign given, but then we see a son given. And we see the fulfillment of this in Matthew chapter 1, where the Bible says in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his, his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. We see the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Bible says Mary and Joseph were, Joseph were espoused together. What does espousal mean? That's a legal marriage, but they hadn't yet come together to consummate the marriage. You see, in a Hebrew marriage, there were three stages. There was the contract stage. If a man wanted to marry a woman, he would have to go see her father. That f father, he would negotiate with him a purchase price. He would have to pay that purchase price, and then he would sign the contract. And at that point, legally... This man's daughter was his wife. That was the espousal stage. But there was a second stage in a Hebrew marriage. It's called the claiming stage. Normally, after the contract was signed, the bridegroom would go back to his house. He would begin to prepare to go and receive his bride. Normally, it was about a year before he would actually come back to claim his bride, that second stage. Even though he was legally married, he was preparing for her, preparing for her, and then he would go and get her with all of his attendants, with all of his groomsmen. He would go and receive his bride and take her back to his house, and there the marriage would be consummated. So what we have going on here with Mary and Joseph is the contract was signed. They were legally married, but the Bible is very clear. It says in verse 18, but before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. You just signed a contract for a bride. Mary now belongs to you. She is your wife. You go back to begin to prepare for her, to go and get her and bring her back and to take her unto yourself. But before that actual stage took place, the claiming stage, he finds out that Mary is going to have a baby. Now, Joseph, he's in a dilemma. We see Joseph's dilemma. We see Joseph's distress. And that is, he doesn't know what to do now. He's a good man and really has a few options. He could just publicly divorce her. Uh, and, and that was certainly something that the law allowed. He could just privately divorce her, not to embarrass her. And that was what he was thinking about doing. In fact, in verse 19, it says, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. So you know what Joseph was going to do? He was just going to divorce her privately. Let her go on, have that child live her own life. He was going to go on with a, just a private divorce. And the Bible says, while he was thinking on these things, God showed up in a dream and God said this. The angel, through the angel, the Lord spoke and said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So we see Joseph's dream. And in a dream, God confirms what takes place here with Mary. It's something that is miraculous. It is of God. She's a virgin, yet she's going to have a child. And then Matthew is very careful to put in this prophecy of Isaiah. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And this is the third part, a savior given. You see, in this prophecy, we have a sign given. We have a son given and we have a savior given. You see, this doctrine of the virgin birth is so foundational to our faith. In fact, if you pull this doctrine out, Christianity crumbles like a house of cards. You know why Jesus had to be virgin born? It was necessary for our salvation. Because that him being virgin born made possible the uniting together of deity and humanity together in one person, both natures dwelling concurrently in one person. It was the virgin birth that made all that possible. The virgin birth also made possible the humanity of Christ without inherited sin. Do you know all of us are children of Adam in the sense that we all inherit that sin nature? It's passed on down to us from our father. But you know, Jesus Christ, since he was virgin born, that sin nature was not passed down to him. He was the sinless son of God. He was born in holiness without sin. And a savior of the world has to be someone who is without sin. In order to be the sin bearer, he would have to be righteous and innocent and pure. And Jesus, the virgin born son of God, fulfills all of that. And he came to be our savior. This is the next part of it. And notice where it says his name will be Emmanuel, which is God with us. God became a man in order that we, he might die for our sins, that we might have salvation, that we might have eternal life. That's the whole reason for the virgin-born son of God. That's why God sent his son. And so that's the reasons for the virgin birth. But let me just give you one last thing, and I'm done. The receiving of the virgin birth. Now notice, Joseph, his response to that dream, the Bible says this, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and he knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. You know what Joseph did? He believed. He believed all of what God said. He believed in the character of Mary. He believed in the miraculous birth, the virgin birth of Jesus. He believed in the truthfulness of the Old Testament prophecy, which prophesied about the virgin birth. He believed that Jesus that was the Son of God and was the Savior. He received it all. He believed it all. And you know what? Joseph is an example to all of us tonight. Of That's what Christmas is all about. And the question I would pose to you tonight is, have you received it? Do you believe that? Do you believe all of this? And are you like Joseph and say, yes, I believe the word of God. I believe Jesus is the savior of men. And I not only believe him, I have received him as my Savior and my Lord. Friend, that's the greatest thing you could ever do. And that's what, if you want to have a real Christmas celebration, it starts with knowing Jesus personally as your Savior, as your Lord. I'm reminded of the songs that we sing. That's why I love these Christmas songs. Christ, by highest heaven adored. Christ, the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold, he come offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as men with men did well, Jesus our Emmanuel. And friend, can you say that from your heart? Not just lip service, but can you say from your heart, Jesus is my Emmanuel. I know him. I'm trusting in him and him alone as my only way, my only hope of salvation. And friend, if you haven't made that decision, I would encourage you to take Christ home with you tonight. Make him your Emmanuel. Let's bow for prayer tonight. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your inspired word. Thank you for your son that you gave to us to be our savior. And I pray that every person here under the sound of my voice knows beyond any shadow of a doubt, that they're trusting in Christ and Christ alone as their only way of salvation. And friend, if you're here tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you haven't ever prayed and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, can I encourage you to do that right now? Right where you are, you can just pray. Reach out in, prayerful, in prayer with faith and say, Lord, 
I, I receive you today as my Savior, my Lord. Cleanse me of all of my sin. Forgive me and save me. And I realize that you came to die for my sins. That I might have eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And friend, pray that and mean it. And the greatest gift you could ever receive is the gift of eternal life through Christ. To know him as your Savior, as your Lord. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.